On behalf of the NIOSH Future of Work Initiative, I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's webinar, The Role of Artificial Intelligence in the Future of Work, and is co-sponsored with the NIOSH Emerging Technologies Branch and the Artificial Intelligence Interest Group. My name is Gary Roth, and I'm going to be your moderator for today. Uh, before we get started in earnest, uh, I'd like to uh, just mention that this is part of a series of webinars uh, by the the Future of Work Initiative, which was launched, the NIOSH Future of Work Initiative, which was launched in 2019, and has many ongoing activities um, and um, is many ongoing activities in different areas. Uh, we've had already one webinar this year, um, and there will be one more to come, the World Demographics and the Future of Work. So we welcome you to join us for that. And if you want more information on the NIOSH Future of Work Initiative, please do visit the website up there and you'll be able to find more information on this webinar, upcoming webinars, and past, as well as a lot of other interesting information. With that, um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers for today. Uh, first, we will uh, we will hear we will begin um, we will begin with Jay Vietas. Um, Jay is the chief of the Emerging Technologies Branch in Division of Science Integration at. National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. He is a team of scientists and study emerging technologies on worker health and practical application of this knowledge. This includes research on the use of advanced materials, synthetic biology, and biomanufacturing and artificial intelligence. Prior to joining NIOSH in 2020, Dr. Vietas served as the senior medical leader at the United States Air Force in the United States Air Force developing policy and supportive operations for 2400 allied health officers in delivering care in 75 treatment facilities. Dr. Vietas obtained his PhD from the University of Cincinnati in environmental health, graduate degrees in environmental health and engineering from Colorado State University, and undergraduate degree in chemistry from the United States Air Force Academy. Dr. Vietas is also a certified industrial hygienist, a certified safety professional, and a member of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. We also have with us esteemed guest, uh, Dr. Dravi. Dr. Hushang Durabi received his PhD in Industrial and Systems Engineering from Rutgers University in 2000. He's currently a professor of Industrial Engineering and a professor of computer, Computing Applications in Healthcare Research Education. Um, Dr. Durabi's research has been published in more than 100 articles with more than 6,000 citations. He's been supported by several government agencies and, and companies, including the United States, between the National Science Foundation, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, and Anthem Inc. Dr. Durabi is a senior member of the Institute of Industrial Systems Engineers and the Institute of Electrical and, Indu Electrical and Electronics Engineers, IEEE. Um, and with that, um, we will begin in earnest. Uh, before we begin, I will discuss a little bit about the format for today. Today's discussion will take place as a more of a panel discussion than a typical presentation. We will uh, proceed with several uh, with several pressing questions in the field of artificial intelligence, and these will be asked for our presenters in turn. So we will go back and forth between them to develop an interesting composite story. Um, and throughout it, please feel free, as I said in the housekeeping section, to ask your questions in the Q&A box. And we'll get to them as they go. Our first question will be directed to Hushang. Hushang, every day we're hearing more about AI and how it's going to change everything in our lives from how we work to how we, to how we play to, to, to basic quality of life. So uh, I think a good place to start would be to give us a good framework for how we think about how AI works. Would you be able to provide one to us? Sure, definitely. Yes, there's actually um, a common framework for all AI problems, which is displayed right now on the screen. Uh, so there are four main components of this generic model and framework. As you can see, I'm just going, going to follow the numbers on the screen. So number one is the environment. This is the application that you have. Now in terms of, uh, you know, usually NIOSH applications, this could be a safety, worker safety problem. And as you can see on the screen, we are looking at the construction site now. Uh, and when we talk about AI, we are basically talking about doing something about the worker safety or health 
to a computer program. So the, every AI system has a computer program for sure. Uh, but that computer program needs to read from the environment. And in this case, you can see the component number two, which is basically is used to read from the environment. In this case, for example, in, this, in terms of construction, let's say we might be uh, attaching some um, you know, GPS sensors or biological sensors to the worker's body. And through those sensors, we are reading the state of the worker. Now, the next step, which is component number three, we are, let's say, we, um, the goal of this AI system is to detect the fall of a worker. So if a worker falls, we need to basically get to that worker very fast. But because the worker has fallen, the worker might not be able to declare that uh, situation himself. So in this case, we basically want uh, some AI system to detect that for us. So in this case, those biological GPS sensors send their signals to an, a machine learning algorithm, which is the core of an AI system. This is the computer programming part. And that program, based on the inputs that it receives, it detects, it says, yes, the worker has fallen. And now we might need to take actions, and that would be the component number four, which is done through our actuators. One example in this case could be that you know, the, the computer could sound an alarm so other people can basically understand that the worker has fallen. Or the other one could be just sending a text to the site manager that the worker has fallen and this is the GPS state of the worker. So if, we, if you look at this, this is basically a loop and uh, it basically does a function which is related to worker safety, but all the components here are basically typical any AI problem has all these components. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Zhang. I, um, I think it's, it's really interesting when you look at, uh, at these systems and how broadly they can be applied. It makes you, makes you think that there's, with enough data and enough computing power, there's applications almost everywhere. And I mean, for those of us, those of us probably experience them on a day-to-day -day basis, whether we use a navigator to get to uh, an auto uh, phone navigator or something like it to get to get to work on a commute or a long trip, um, recommendations for video, the next video we want to watch, um, and, and so on. Uh, and and we know it's becoming increasingly widely used. Uh, I guess a good uh, good follow-up to that would be to ask uh, Jay, um, how are we using AI here at NIOSH? Are we using it? If so, if so, where? And and are we using it? Um, to make existing systems more effective, or are there entirely new ones where we're coming up with as, as it stands now? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Gary. Uh, thanks for serving as uh, the moderator. Uh, and thanks, uh, Sarah Tamers and the entire Creature Work Initiative uh, for putting on this uh, webinar. And uh, thank you, uh, Hushang, for uh, serving also uh, on this panel with me uh, as, uh, on this important topic area, and, and certainly to the audience, thanks for joining uh, today. Yeah, ab you're, you're absolutely right, uh, uh, Gary, in terms of that it's uh, not only in the fabric of society, but it's in the fabric of uh, NIOSH. Uh, and uh, we've been using uh, artificial intelligence for, for, uh, for years now, if you will, but, uh, but I think that they're emerging are some great opportunities uh, going forward, and not only will it be in the fabric of the future of work, but it's going to be in the, the fabric of uh, solutions to uh, the future of work as well as, as Hushang just uh, eloquently described on how that system's worked. Uh, I kind of related some of the, you. You talked about uh, uh, you know the uh, um, Netflix uh, picking out your uh, um, your next uh, movie or, or whatever, but uh, really that's that's patterns and. Uh, um, I should say, I'll start back over and saying that, you know, that one of the modes that we've used uh, this, uh, the technology is nat natural language processing. Uh, and, uh, you know, most people are familiar with that through targeted ads that they might have through their social media, or it might be some sort of voice assistance like they have with Siri, or uh, maybe they have that in their car and navigation telling them where you want to go. Uh, for us in, in NIOSH, uh, this has been successfully used for, for auto uh, coding workers' compensation claims. You know, the state of Ohio uh, has partnered with us and has uh, a wealth of data with respect to uh, workers' compensation claims. 
But uh, those claims are filed with open text narrative fields, uh, and those narrative fields, uh, you know, don't they're good, but if you're going to pour through all of them to be able to mine out the good, good information that's in there and be able to come up with interventional strategies on how to improve worker safety and health, that would take a fair amount of time. And so uh, auto coding for what those, those classifications are has been really successful in, in terms of helping us as, as an organization. We've also used that same natural language processing uh, feature to be able to look at the, the fatality reports from uh, the mining operations from our research uh, the division. And uh, they've taken the Mine Safety Health Administrative Fatality Reports and to be able to, uh, again, come up with some uh, opportunities for us in terms of classifying the, the areas of, uh, of concern and, and obviously the, uh, again, areas of opportunity. Another area in which uh, AI has been really successful is with uh, computer vision. Uh, whether that's you know taking your uh, iPhone uh, and uh, and uh, allowing you that that person to get in through facial recognition or some sort of augmented reality or let's say you, you're looking for a, a picture of a dog on your phone you can type in that dog and it'll it will actually be able the computer's been trained uh, to recognize that uh, you have a picture of a dog. Um, the same kind of technology has been used within NIOSH to be able to evaluate. Uh, some of the, the uh, personal protective equipment, uh, some of the protective materials uh, can be evaluated through fluorescent dyes and essentially evaluated for their performance through this, the same mechanism or to classify uh, animal uh, sample histopathology and particle deposition, again, training the system to be able to look for these patterns uh, or even categorize nanostructure, nanoscale structures. Uh, again, uh, this computer vision can be very, very powerful in that respect. Uh, and then uh, predictive analytics uh, in society, you, you know, you might not know it, but uh, if you were to use your credit card in a unorthodox pattern, you might be alerted from the credit card company that there might be some sort of a fraud detection uh, or fraud issue associated with that credit card. And that's really a result of artificial intelligence. Uh, and as I was mentioning before about Netflix, you know, the, the uh, helping you to figure out which, uh, which uh, show to watch, that's really uh, predictive analytics. I even just read an, uh, an article uh, uh, regarding the use of chips in uh, our vehicle tires and to be able to predict uh, when you might actually be at most at risk for a flat. I mean, these are some of the great tools that are going to come out of AI. And we're, we're using those same kind of uh, tools to be able to uh, evaluate exoskeletons and predict the uh, <clears throat> uh, biomechanical features associated with those exoskeletons uh, to be able to use simulations. Uh, you know, essentially simulating uh, equipment fires within mines and then be able to look at the response for the ventilation network to ensure that, uh, you know, the, the actions that we take are ensure stability of, of the mine and the ventilation uh, shafts themselves, uh, or to be able to, through a variety of parameters within uh, mines, to understand uh, the roof sag and thus be able to work with mining engineers to build safer safer mines. So these are these are all great uh, tools for improving safety through the use of artificial intelligence. And then we could spend an entire session just talking about all the good work that's being done by the Center of, of uh, Occupational uh, Robotics Research, but uh, they, they are very involved in the use of uh, artificial intelligence and helping out with smart path planning for uh, collaborative robots using deep uh, learning technologies. But most of us kind of know that through uh, maybe some of the automated uh, vehicle research that is, that is going on. So lots of great uh, happenings with respect to artificial intelligence uh, at NIOSH and uh, uh, glad to be able to share those with you today. Thank you very much. It was a very, very informative answer. I think that we should probably uh, uh, take a step back here and, and look at some of the common threads. A lot of the things we talked about had to do with um, with classifying and looking at a data set and pulling out common eyes which to make decisions. And, and it sounds in a lot of ways like there's a lot of statistical analysis involved, but it doesn't seem like the whole story. So um, I, I'd like to turn it back to Shang and ask it if he could if he could describe and elaborate a little bit on on how AI fits um, in statistical analysis. Is it part of AI? Is it all of AI? Or is it how, how do they relate? Sure, again, thank you. 
definitely, that's a that's a very interesting question, and and uh, in fact, I have been asked that question many many times. Um, so we started with uh, statistical analysis many many years ago, and I remember, you know, that's like a normal thing that is taught everywhere in uh, occupational safety programs. Uh, and now we have AI. So the, what, what, what are the differences? The fact is that the root of you know, machine learning, which is the program or the models that are the core of the AI system, that, that is still statistics. In, in fact, we call it statistical learning. But there are differences between machine learning or statistical learning and statistical analysis. So um, I actually, the, the slide on the screen shows the three main uh, topics that basically create these differences. One is the uh, distribution assumption. Uh, in many, many statistical models, statistical analysis, we are making uh, some, we have the assumption that we know the underlying distribution of the data. In many cases, we assume it's a bell-shaped normal distribution. Um, when it comes to machine learning, the data that you deal with, we don't even care about the distribution. In fact, if you know the distribution of the data, usually you can use a statistical analysis to answer many questions. The fact is that maybe 99% of cases in real world, you don't know the distribution or probability distribution. And, and that, is, that is really appropriate for uh, machine learning. The next topic, which creates a difference between these two is that Statistical analysis problems um, usually deal with few inputs and, and outputs. Usually we have two, three, one you know, inputs and maybe one output. And the decisions that we're trying to um, basically investigate using statistical analysis are simple. I think all of us know regression models, right? That you have like one input, one output, and you're trying to establish between the uh, relationship between these two. Or you can have multiple inputs, one output, or multiple inputs, multiple outputs. But the fact is that those are few stage, few variables, simple decisions. When you go to the machine learning part, now we are talking about many inputs and outputs. In fact, I uh, myself have um, worked on problems with maybe 100 inputs, 100, 100 different uh, data items, and many, many outputs. The other characteristic is that the decisions that we are talking about here in machine learning are very, very complex. Uh, and um, they might have multiple stages. This, we are talking about a, an autonomous car that could decide to stop, right? This is a very complex decision. No statistical analysis method can do that. The only way to do that is artificial intelligence. Um, and then finally, the model evaluation. Uh, there are certain evaluation metrics when it comes to statistical analysis. We all know type one, type two errors, power of you know, test, R squared, mean squared error, and so on. There are several of them, but I have listed only three. Um, but, but when it comes to status, uh, machine learning, the metrics are completely different, even though that they are kind of coming from statistical analysis still, but they are in a different way. Um, calculated and, um, and if we can name confusion matrix. And this is when we talk about confusion matrix, we are talking about a model which is trying to classify certain, uh, you know, certain input. For example, whether a patient uh, dies or not. And the question confusion matrix is how many patients who died this model determines or predicts that they die. And, and how many of patients who, who stay alive, the model correctly um, predicts that they are alive. So that, those are the correct one. And then you can have two wrong ones, right? The ones who die, but the model says they are alive and so. So confusion matrix is the matrix that shows those four components, of course, for a binary classification. If you have more than that, uh, then confusion matrix would be larger, of course. And then AUC or area under the curve, which is a real metric for uh, you know, pre, um, the value or uh, evaluation of um, an AI model. If I have time later, um, you know, I might uh, explain more about AUC. But I think that would be uh, for now uh, you know, about this comparison. Well, 
that was that was a, a lot of information that really helped to to separate these two ideas, which are often linked um, and 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 are indeed linked, but aren't definitely not the same thing. And I will tell you that the audience questions have been rolling in, so hopefully uh, hopefully we get an opportunity to elaborate on it later. Um, we're going to come back around to discussing some implications of AI. Uh, it, we've seen this a very powerful and flexible tool that lets us do things that your know, statistical analysis would not, and it's being used in more and more places. So it, it would be interesting to talk about what the positives, some we some songs we've seen, but what are the bigger positive implications? Also, what could be the the negative ones? So Jay, would you uh, would you be would you be willing to go and, and discuss perhaps some of the harms um, and indirect or otherwise that could might uh, might occur as a result of AI use? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, while while I'm buoyed by uh, the the future of AI and its implications on on society writ large, uh, the in the workplace uh, and, and in society, but uh, I, I think that there are definitely some con concerns that we should attend to. Uh, and, and discuss. I think it's fair to make sure that we're having those kinds of discussions. Uh, and I think it begins with the, the data. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of put a thought bubble here because uh, there's some concerns that are, are uh, related to the worker. There's some concerns related to the workplace and the employer. Uh, they don't always uh, match. They oftentimes overlap in terms of their, the amount of concern or the interest in the concern, uh, but they're, they're all worthy of discussion. Uh, like I said, beginning with the data, uh, that because uh, that's really uh, how this all begins, is that uh, collecting data. And uh, I'll start with the, the workers' concern for privacy. You know, traditional industrial hygienists will go out and collect a sample on, on, a, on a worker, and that's one data point. There was concern about, uh, you know, whose data point that belonged to, but oftentimes it was, you know, we took a couple of measures and, and all, all was good. And, and certainly born out of that were, you know, rules like uh, HIPAA and uh, et cetera. But uh, in the future workplace, you're probably going to have some sort of uh, additional sensors placed on individuals or you're going to be watching individuals uh, and uh, might even geolocate where they are all day long. And uh, so there could be some, you know, what, what are the privacy concerns about, you know, how often they use the restroom or where they are at a particular time or how long a break they take. And, and certainly the, uh, the concerns for a worker uh, would be, you know, maybe they don't take breaks. Uh, maybe they don't go and use the restroom like they should. And so those, there could be physical harm, but I think there also could be the big brother, you know, emotional harm essentially about watching over these folks. Uh, the other part is the, the confidentiality of this information. So you've, you've, I know that uh, privacy and confidentiality are linked, but really, you know, that is more about the workplace and the, the sort of the rules and responsibilities of the, the employer with respect to, you know, who has access to this data and how is it being used and how are you putting some of this data together? Uh, you know, confidentiality is not new, but will become a broader issue when there is so much more data being collected. And now you're going to involve data scientists and computer programmers potentially in the mix, uh, and who's it going to be shared with? And is it peers, supervisors, management, uh, and just we need to attend to the potential uh, for that uh, being accessed too widely. And obviously, it, this all relates into the security of the data overall. Uh, where is it stored? How's it being stored? You know, what is the access? And, and I really think from a worker uh, health and well-being perspective, uh, the harm really comes in with respect to the perception of trust as much as the reality of trust. Uh, I, uh, we're all probably familiar with some of the news reports of, uh, you know, the hacks into, let's say, from the Russians uh, into the uh, uh, recent pipeline in the, in the southeast here or uh, the breaches of Equifax and uh, Marriott and Yahoo traditionally, and I can go on and on. There's a, a long list of those. And that, that will play into the perception of data security. Uh, and I think it will be important for that to be managed and uh, overseen and, and for folks to be transparent about that piece of it. But in, in addition to the data, I think there's design of how the systems uh, are, are developed and, and uh, used in that. I, I, while I, I, I'm interested in that, I, I find technology to be fascinating and I think it's going to improve, it has improved our lives. I think if you look at the trajectory of technology, it, is, it has made our lives so much better. But I, but I think in this case, because it's uh, so exciting, I think that there can be fear of uh, appropriate fear or risk of, of not including uh, the human in the design of these systems. 
Uh, and uh, so I think it's important for us to make sure that that occurs. Uh, traditionally, we thought about maybe it was going to the technology, and I still think this is a concern about placing us in some sort of an awkward position or asking us to do things repetitively that, uh, that might uh, overburden the human or ask the human to do too many tasks at once. All these, I think, are fair concerns. But I think as we're merging into uh, a time when the technology is such where you're not going to need a, a large and robust workforce to be able to uh, use these systems, and these systems are going to pervade 24-7 operate or allow for 24-7 operations, uh, you know, the human might also be designed in to, uh, or lack of design in, I guess I should say, to be uh, responding in the middle of the night or responding uh, on the weekends. And uh, I think, again, towards well-being, uh, this, is, this is a potential harm that, that, that could occur. And then there's a large discussion. We could probably have a full day discussion about data and bias. Uh, and uh, so, so this is one of the real harms that can occur. And I'll just simply describe it as, um, you know, when the data set that is used and trained uh, to train the system then does not represent uh, how the outcomes are placed upon the, uh, the workforce that is, is using it. And so uh, a simple one that most people are probably familiar with is some of the facial recognition technologies that were trained using uh, primarily white uh, male uh, participants, and yet uh, it, some people were surprised that uh, facial recognition doesn't work well, or those systems didn't work very well on uh, dark-skinned uh, females, for example. So that, that's a prime example of where, you know, the, the data uh, set that was collected was not representative of the population, uh, and that's just one bias. I think for the occupational safety and health professional, you have to think about health equity and the, the bias uh, sort of a, a in, in, uh, in our systems in general, the research that has been done historically does favor again, the, the white male as research subjects um, or may fa favor certain populations is probably the better way to say that. We just need to make sure that, that those systems are representing the population of interest. Uh, and all these challenges sort of roll into the ethical and responsible uh, implementation of artificial intelligence as a whole. Uh, you know, AI should really not be that black box. Uh, you know, instead, it should be transparently implemented. And, and I think we need to have these open discussions about uh, where there may be dehumanization uh, in those particular systems. And I think maintaining that human anon uh, autonomy, and more importantly, human choice in all of this, uh, should be uh, considered a prime goal uh, in, in all involved. Thank you, Jay. That's a uh, that that's a great dive into a lot of issues. Not all, a lot of which are just not direct uh, effects of like the classic AI run amok, but just systemic issues that can creep in. And and it does go to a number of questions we've been asked. We've been asked uh, about uh, cybersecurity related questions around these big data sets that are collected to power AI, biasing in data sets, and how to unbiased data. Maybe we'll get a chance to get to them later, time permitting. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take we ask and ask the one question that has. Not showing up, but it's very surprising to me because I think I've seen it in every chat I've ever seen asked about AI, which is you talk about the dehumanization of AI and systems, the fact that it can overtax people, the fact that the that the human is not had in mind and it's doing more and more. Do they are they designing out the human entirely? Is the AI going to take my job? Is it going to take everyone else's jobs? Uh, you have anything to share on that? Yeah, that's a fair question, uh, and, and certainly uh, I I think that uh, there, there is you know, open debate and discussion about how AI might, uh, and much like any other technology through history, uh, that, that uh, the technology might take away the, uh, the need for humans to work. Uh, I, there was one study that was published uh, in 2013 that estimated that 47, 47% of jobs in the US uh, could be susceptible to computerization uh, in the next 20 years. Uh, so, so, I mean, I think there's some that are prognosticating that, uh, yeah, that's gonna, it's going to happen. I think there's a other debate that looks at the various classes of workers. Uh, you know, this is deemed sort of occupational polarization in which uh, the, the high-skilled workers uh, likely are still going to be needed, and the low-skilled workers are also, you know, not, uh, you know, help, assisted by AI. Uh, and really, it's the middle-income workers who are going to be most affected, you know, your uh, market analysts and uh, 
uh, and such. But I, you know, I think a sort of a, a more middle of the road approach to this, and again, the, all of these I think are worthy of debate and consideration would be that uh, AI will be likely very complementary to uh, most, if not all jobs in the future. And it really, I think having an understanding of artificial intelligence and how to employ artificial intelligence and in improving the the human outcomes that we're all interested in, whether it be a corporation or societal wide, uh, that, uh, that that's what uh, AI is gonna help with. It's a tool, it's just another tool for humans. I think there will be more jobs for, for folks because of AI. Yes, there will be uh, some reductions, but really the, just the changing landscape uh, and uh, appropriate discussion here with respect to future of work is that AI will become a, it leave a huge mark in that future of work going forward. Uh, and I, th I think uh, you know, that's really how to look at uh, the impact of jobs on it uh, as a result of AI. Thank you, Jay. It's, uh, it's both, both up to know that there will be opportunities, but also a little bit intimidating to know what's coming down the pipe in a lot of regards uh, in, in that way. Um, I think that this is, um, this is a good opportunity to you know, think about the roles in which AI is, is, is being found. We, we usually think a lot about AI in computer science applications specifically, but it seems like AI is is going to be everywhere. And um, you know, for for me, and I suspect I suspect a lot of our audience are probably interested in in the use of AI in occupational safety and health because if we if we don't have those skill sets, well, if we have those skill sets, maybe we're more well positioned to to be able to utilize AI instead of being looked at as well. Maybe AI can do what we do better, integrating with our AI better. Bushang, what are the skills that we should really look to become proficient in if we're if we're to master AI technology and make it and make it a tool in our kit and better empower ourselves? Sure. Yes, I, I think it, it's very important to understand that um, AI is not computer science by itself. So it is not like if you just bring computer science people to your organization, you can develop any AI that that is needed. That is not true. So in fact, in order for an AI system to work and successfully does what it is supposed to do, you need different skills. And uh, what you see on the screen actually um, kind of general functions and skills that are needed for an AI team to develop an AI application. And uh, the right side, the backgrounds, but those are you know just some choices that we have written here, but you know, it could be from any background, as long as you know the skills and you know the functions you can perform. So if I want to summarize this, AI, you know, as we showed uh, in, the, in the first slide, uh, the conceptual AI box, every AI system works with an environment. So that's, that's, that's the key. And that environment is a physical real work in a real world environment. Like we gave an example for construction site, or uh, you can imagine a manufacturing system or a mine. Um, so it, uh, you always have that component in an AI system. So there is, a, there is a real world function that you deal with. If you are developing an AI system for that function, you want to save the workers who are doing that function, who are a part of that system, you need experts who know that system. Like you need people who understand mining, you, they understand the hazards, they understand the situations that unsafe events could happen. You need the workers to just tell you how they feel, how they can use the technology. So, in order for an AI system to work, you can't just bring a programmer in and expect everything to work. In fact, I have been engaged in many projects where programmers and computer scientists are saying things that are very funny. I, I'm actually one of them, so don't think that I'm also a computer scientist. But sometimes if we just look at the model and what it says, we might come back and say something very funny. And the people who are in the practice in the field they might say that doesn't make any sense. And I can come back and say, oh no, but my model says that is, that's gonna happen. And say, no, that's impossible. So you can see that if AI is led by computer science field, it's dead. And if AI 
is led by just people who don't know programming, that, that never happens. The only way for this to work is these people come together and work together, and there are multiple steps that they need to check, and they're actually written here. They need to check different things. When it comes to programming, of course, the computer science experts are the ones who are going to write it, but what, whether the AI uh, output is acceptable, whether it makes sense, whether it's implementable. AI might ask for something that is not possible in real world to implement. All those things should be done actually. And the data sets, who's going to create the data sets? Computer scientists cannot do that. The people who are working, the workers, the ARSH professionals, they are the ones who are going to create the data sets. And without data sets, you have no AI. So, so as you can see, it's a very team type of work. And without that, I don't think anything can happen. Well, th thank you, Shang. That's, uh, that's really interesting. It, it tells us sometimes where the uh, who is this designed for question comes from. But also, it, it, tells us, it tells us that it really does take, it's not just the computer science at work. It really requires, it requires a team of, of multidisciplinary expertise to, to get it done. Um, you know, it, that means there's probably a lot of good collaborative work going on, and in, in, in particularly, I imagine occupational safety and health implications. Maybe uh, could do you uh, could maybe you could talk a little bit about like primary stakeholders, big participants, and and folks like that. That would that might help us understand a little bit more about who's involved, how these teams are created. Sure, definitely yes. So this is the part that I think it's is uh, very important to, uh, to me and I am sure to the audience here. Um, and I, I see some questions here. They are asking, you know, where are the data sets that we can use reliable data sets or, or uh, you know, has, has there been any work done in, the, in terms of man machine interface uh, and safety and AI? Uh, so um, in fact, you know, what you see on the screen uh, is basically uh, all the stakeholders, uh, in blue boxes, and the functions that you can see, uh, you know, in other basically shapes on the screen, there are different ones, um, and the colors uh, of uh, of the functions show their state. So we recently, uh, you know, finished. Um, in fact, you know, the, uh, a research which is going to uh, appear very soon in a journal. Uh, it, it, it was accepted very recently and it's going to appear, which is a basically review of AI in ARSH. And, and what you see here is based on that paper. So we studied, actually, we looked at everything um, in this area. And uh, as you can see, there are multiple. So let me just quickly go over the stakeholders first, the blue boxes, and then go through their functions. So you have uh, from the left side of screen, so you have industries that use AI in ARSH. If you go to construction, mining, agriculture, manufacturing, and many, many more, they are actually using AI already. There are numerous work, and, and you, can, you can actually see uh, that companies are using those. So that, those are one stakeholders that are in the game of AI and ARSH. And then you also have industries that create AI products. Believe it or not, there are many of them. There are many companies that create, in fact, we have a map of these companies that you know, if anyone is interested, you know, we can send, share it with them later. But um, there are many companies that provide AI technologies. And then we also have academia to the right, where um, these, are, these are the organizations that are, that are going to do workforce training. And, develop, and they are, they are they're going to train professionals, students, to actually know AI and ARSH. And we also have government. NIESH is the main entity there uh, that, that has so many functions. And finally, support organizations such as professional societies. Now, if you look at the functions, the, in terms of the, uh, from the green uh, ones, we, in terms of develop, deploying uh, products and technologies, we have a lot of them. So I assume that we have had significant progress in that area. In terms of developing ARSH and uh, uh, developing them, we also have deploying and development. They are kind of, industries are using them, companies are producing them. 
So that's no problem. Now, when you go to publications, the publication is, is good, but it is not ideal. So in fact, we are inviting uh, you know, all the people on this call and all the researchers to really think about publi pub publishing in this area. And then conferences, workshops, there are a few which are focused on OSH, AI, so many, but AI and OSH, very few. And that would be a direction to go. Research is being done to some extent, but it can be done more. Now look at the, look at the red ones. These are the areas that we really need to pay attention because we couldn't find, we, we found either zero or negligible progress, funding. There is no focused funding on AI in OSH. There's nothing really. Training and workforce development, we looked at all the universities. We couldn't find a single program which trains OSH professionals for AI. Certifications, degrees, there are none. There are very few. Databases, there is a question actually, is there, where are the data sets that we can, that are reliable we can use? They don't exist. You know, that's, that's the other one. This is a big area. Without data sets, reliable data sets, nothing will happen. And regulations and standards, Jay talked about ethics, you know, uh, and how we can trust AI. The, one of the best ways of making sure that AI is not harming us, but is helping us, is actually to set those regulations and standards. And we don't have them right now. There is nothing out there. So this basically slide summarizes everything in my opinion uh, in this area and and i think this is um, a starting point for us to basically go and say what should we really do in order to advance this area thanks Hushang. that gives us uh, a very good idea as to as what the state of progress is as well as what the real opportunities are um, and I think that's a good spot to, to pivot towards the end of this phase of the discussion. We, we've talked a lot about AI on a conceptual level, the way it differs from machine learning, uh, wh where it's being implemented, what NIOSH is doing it, what some of the hazards are, how teams are built around it, and, and a lot of details of, of that surround AI. So the question is, what are we doing this? Where, where do we go from here? Um, in NIOSH's case particularly, what, what, what should we be doing in addition to what we're already doing and and what kinds of questions need do we need to answer in order to ensure that AI the successful use of AI in the future of work Jay take us into the future here yeah I, I think uh, a great segue from uh, what Hushang was just talking about uh, graying laying out some of the really the the opportunities the if you want will some of the deficits that exist out there uh, and, uh, you know, we, we can choose to bury our head in the sand and not uh, pay attention to this. It will, AI will still come. Uh, and uh, so I, I know that NIOSH is very interested in, in uh, addressing this particular issue as part of the Future of Work initiative. In fact, uh, we'll soon be publishing a research agenda uh, for the future of work. And that will include some of the concepts that I've laid out here uh, in terms of addressing uh, artificial intelligence and the needs for, with respect to artificial intelligence. So, uh, you know, I, I think it begins with, you know, how do you assess risk with respect to these systems, you know, and, and what kind of tools can we provide to the occupational safety and health practitioner uh, to, to help with assessment of risk? I mean, risk isn't going to be a sole uh, occupation, or I should say sole a responsibility of the occupational safety and health professional. It is a, a corporate uh, effort or a em, uh, employer kind of effort, but uh, still at the same time, how do we arm the, the OSH practitioner with that respect? So I, I think there's some great research opportunities there. Uh, really just understanding, I, I mentioned some of the potential harms that exist, but really what are those unintended consequences? That's, I mean, I, I don't think any of these systems intend to cause harm. So these would be the, the unintended uh, consequences. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's some safety and health ones that, that traditionally we can evaluate, but I, I think, uh, and NIOSH has been great with respect to leading the way with uh, the total worker health initiative to be looking at well-being as an important part of uh, worker safety and health. And uh, I, I think that AI potentially has a significant uh, impact in this part uh, of the workforce and uh, should be attended to. Uh, certainly, I, I mentioned about how we might forget how humans interfaced uh, uh, with these systems, but again, the implications on trust in, in both directions. Uh, 
Uh, I think that uh, sometimes we are as a, and I'll even personally put myself in this position, you, you think the systems are almost in, perfect and uh, infallible. Uh, and uh, so, th but there's, that, there's a, a, a significant uh, probably risk associated with uh, those workers who trust too much in those systems and then have them fail. Uh, I, I, I think of how, uh, particularly people who are on the job for a very long time start to become very complacent about uh, systems. The same can be true with these. Uh, the flip side of it, and we have a, a whole, uh, I think, emerging distrust in science, but uh, I'll say distrust in technology and, and artificial intelligence, and that will that will potentially show here. I think there's a lot of research opportunities in this particular area. I think an exciting area with respect to uh, essentially the OSH practitioner in a toolbox is how can you help uh, the humans make better decisions in the workplace? Uh, it, it segues nicely with that last, uh, you know, trust in the systems. But I think if you can build the systems which tell humans uh, more effectively or help them in, in decision making to reduce risk, I think that that would be fantastic. Only again, if they trust the systems and they work. Uh, and that includes being able to de detect uh, accidents between humans and machines. Uh, again, our, our Center for Occupational uh, Robotics Research is, is doing some of this, uh, this research that I think uh, extends nicely into the AI domain. And then I, I touched on worker uh, discrimination, the use of data sets that are biased and uh, the implications on uh, the, the well-being of, uh, of our workforce. I, I think, again, this is a primary of, of uh, potential exploration. And then, uh, you know, lastly, and again, we can talk about all these in, in specific depth, but uh, we, we, we don't have time today. But uh, I think it's really to exploit uh, AI and develop tools that uh, use AI to help with the occupational safety and health professional. You know, I, I think that more data points uh, used appropriately for assessing worker exposure or to measure uh, their particular well-being or to understand where they're uh, are, are more risks, if you will, can help. Uh, and so there's, there's great opportunity in this particular area. Uh, and uh, I, I know Hushang and I agree a lot. Uh, there's, there's nice synergy, I think, in a lot of the efforts that are, that are going on, but uh, we're at the ground floor uh, of a lot of these efforts. Thank you, Jay. Uh, really appreciate really appreciate that and uh, telling us, you know, the direction we're headed, the various opportunities that we have in front of us to explore. I'd like to thank both you, Jay, as well as you, Hushang, uh, for, for that very good discussion. Um, we're going to have the opportunity, we hope, to answer some, uh, to answer some questions from our audience. Uh, we have had more, we have 13 minutes left, and it looks like we have more questions than there are minutes. So we're going to get to as many of them as we can, um, and uh, we'll answer them in, 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 uh, in sequential order um, as we can, get to as many as we can. Okay, so our first question from an anonymous attendee. They are interested to know about any thoughts on AI in automated vehicles level one through five from an industrial hygiene and occupational safety viewpoint. Have occupational hazards been identified? And if so, what are they? Jay, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I know, again, the, the Center for Occupational uh, Robotics Research is working on, on uh, automated vehicles and looking at these kinds of issues. Uh, I, again, I think we're in the early phases of this. Are there occupational hazards? Certainly the, there are. Uh, and uh, so I, I would say that the research is needed in this particular area. Uh, obviously, they're running into uh, humans and uh, uh, causing more damage uh, and uh, uh, probably is is the the main one, but there's the again the trust in the equipment and you know what's the data that's generating uh, the movement of these vehicles. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of uh, opportunities for uh, for looking into this. Thank you, Jay. Um, our next question comes from, and I will do my best to pronounce correctly. Please forgive me if I if I do not. Ibrahim Tarshizi. Um, the question is, to build up a modern AI product and improve safety, we need quality and unbiased data from different work environments, fields, and what is NYSHA's strategy, plan, or proposal to better improve date, quality data collection in different industries? Sounds to me like this was something that we were hitting on earlier. Jay, do you want to elaborate more? 
Yeah, and I, I, again, I, I think it's, uh, you know, the quality, we were, you know, any of these systems uh, are only as good as the, the quality of the data that's collected. And uh, certainly that's, that's a, a premise that's based in, in good scientific research in the first place. But certainly it is uh, when you're using uh, systems or AI systems or algorithms that maybe you don't know what's going on exactly in the background, uh, that's even more important uh, in terms of developing outcomes. Uh, how NIOSH is, is uh, you know, certainly I think that that's our responsibility to be attending to the quality of data and to be uh, developing uh, or harnessing probably evaluation systems that exist out there. I know there's lots of good discussion within the AI community about how do you evaluate uh, both the models and the data, and then how do you treat the data? Uh, and uh, those those systems, I think, uh, that are going to be put in place outside of NASH are worth worthy of looking at and how they apply to to us as well. Thank you, Jay. Um, our next question comes from Alex Marbut. How do AI experts draw the distinction between AI and machine learning? For example, when could an ensemble classification algorithm, example given RAM Forest to detect fraud or spam, uh, begin to be classified as artificial intelligence. Um, I'm going to direct this one to Shang. Do you have any thoughts on this? Sure. Uh, well, if I don't know if it's possible to show slide number six on the screen. So, because that makes it easier. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So, this whole box that you see here is that that is AI, and the ensemble method the classification algorithm is box number three. So as you can see, in order to have AI, you have you need other components, uh, and that ensemble method classification algorithm is just a computer code which receives data and then it classifies the input. So the receive and the classification output those are outside the machine learning part. Um, so so that's the best. And and this model on the screen this works for everything. Every single AI application you can actually fit it into these components. Thank you very much. Um, so we, uh, we're going to continue with a question from an anonymous attendee. Is there any data that describes types of occupational injuries currently experienced as a, resu as a result of worker, as a result of accidents at the human machine interface? Jay. Yeah, again, to our, our teammates over in, uh, in core do have some, some uh, data that they've, they've collected and, and looked at in, in sort of the robotics uh, area. I, I, I am not familiar with data that's specific to this particular uh, question, although I, I do believe that, that if, uh, you know, that this is one of those areas that should be explored if it hasn't been uh, already. I do think going forward, it's going to need to be uh, continuously explored. I think that this is part of the research agenda that, uh, that needs to be included to make sure that we understand how you know, we, we think of more physical systems, again, and, you know, the more physical injuries or maybe the uh, chemical exposures that might re uh, result of that. I, I think it's, again, some of the, what is defined, if you will, by these terms uh, with respect to, uh, um, you know, the, what, what is the, um, well, going back to the question now, uh, the, what is the definition of occupational injury is probably the way to say that. So, you know, and, and this is that well-being kind of question that might exist in terms of the human inter, uh, machine interface. If you ask somebody to multitask too much uh, and it causes some sort of downstream occupational injury uh, or it causes some mental stress because it's, they're asked to do too much, uh, that puts them uh, in, let's say, some some sort of uh, you know need for therapy or something along those lines. Those those may be classified as uh, occupational injuries of the future that we need to be attending to. Thank you, Jay. Um, our next question is from an at anonymous attendee. Uh, how do we address IoT, that would be Internet of Things, and AI security concerns related to hackers? I think this is a very broad question about cybersecurity, legal liability regimes and policies. Um, do uh, do uh, We'll start with Jay. Jay, do you have any elaboration, uh, any thoughts on this? Well, I, I think that uh, it's a, you know, my, my simple thought would be uh, that we, we need to make sure that we have an appropriate risk assessment done on the securities of these systems. Uh, and and I, I highlight the term risk assessment because I, I don't think everything is equal. I mean, I, 
I, I've also been, uh, you know, the, I guess you could say the benefactor of, of uh, risk assessments that uh, the security, data security folks do that says that I shouldn't do anything. Uh, you know, the, the safest airplane is one that never flies off the ground. Uh, but really, you know, how do we make sure that we're taking advantage of technology and, and the promise of AI while at the same time uh, and, and the Internet uh, of things as well? But, uh, but we, we do need to be uh, cognizant and transparent and discuss, openly discuss uh, the risks of these systems as well. Thank you, Jay. Hu Shang, would you like to elaborate at all? Uh, just, just quickly, um, the, the security issue unfortunately it can never be solved. So if, if you are waiting for uh, a time that we can say, oh, we can, hackers can never get into this system, that will never happen because if that happens, it contradicts the logic that AI is designed. There's always something that you can do to beat a system which was designed before by just identifying the issues with that system. So the whole issue is, uh, is to just stay one step ahead the problem is that when it comes to AI applications, if you have a customized system, that would be extremely difficult and you really need to bring in security experts to help you. If you have like a Microsoft Windows, you should not be worried because Microsoft is trying its best and probably nobody can do better than Microsoft when it comes to Windows uh, or Apple when it comes to Mac. So, but, but uh, in terms of, um, you know, specific systems when it comes to workers and safety, and uh, those are really difficult to completely 100% secure. Uh, but there are lots of progress in that area. So again, it depends on the system. We cannot provide a general answer to this question. Yeah. Thank you, Hushang, for the elaboration. Um, we have time for maybe one, two, possibly three more questions if, if we're quick. Um, and next one is from Azita M. Have applications for AI been developed in terms of monitoring workers <laughs> work remotely as workplaces shift in that direction? Jay, do you have any th thoughts on that? So I'll, I'll say I've not uh, you know, been involved with or uh, specifically know of one, but I am sure that it exists. Uh, you know, so uh, yeah, to mean, easily someone could turn on a camera and watch me at home. That would be, you know, and and no and keep time of me sitting there and me working and, uh, you know, that that uh, that technology exists. Whether or not uh, it's being employed uh, writ large, I, I, that I do not know. Spare Hushang, have you heard of any uh, specific technologies in this role? Field yes, actually that. there are, and uh, my best answer would be, I, I don't know if it's possible to later on, but we, as I mentioned, there, we have a paper that's coming out and there are multiple applications. It's a review paper, so it basically reviews what is out there uh, in terms of AI in OSH, and, and, and there are multiple applications in the mi in mining industry, agriculture industry, construction industry. There are ways that you can remotely monitor workers and also identify the situations that the probability of a safety accident could, could be significant. So the AI can actually identify when something might happen uh, and what's the probability of that. And, and remotely, you can monitor all those. So yes, so, but I, I would definitely be happy to share uh, you know, that paper yep. later with whoever needs. We are almost up to the hour, unfortunately. I think that we only have, we probably do not have time for further questions except one. We have had several requests to know if this webinar and the slides and content will be available. And the answer is yes, it will be available on the future, on the NIOSH Future of Work Initiative website. So you can feel free to find it there. Um, with that, we are, we do not, likely have time for any further questions. Um, so with that, I want to say thank you very much to, uh, to both of you, Jay and Hushang, for your very thoughtful presentations and dialogue today. Also to Sarah Mitchell and to Kiana Harper for their technical support and uh, to, all of our to all of our attendees for joining the Future of Work in Initiatives webinar on the role of artificial intelligence in the future of work. Uh, please, again, do visit that website um, and there will be more forthcoming. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay well. Goodbye.